for us to get this discussion going, we got to have a round table. We got to invite everybody to the table. To your point, Miss, and I don't know your name, but to your point, who do you have for stakeholders at the table is critical. Because if y'all are talking about me and I'm not at the table, that that sends a message to me. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite. If if you if you respect somebody enough to hate them. That sends a big signal. But if you don't even respect them enough to hate them, that's the opposite of love. That's apathy. Nothing is worse than, than not even being invited to the table or, or lack of respect for the voice that you have at the table. So we've got to have everybody at the table. And, and when we say suppliers, guys, this means suppliers of intellect. This means suppliers of science and technology. This means suppliers of, of advances that go beyond just, hey, here's your feed. And not to belittle feed, because I was a feed salesman. That's, that's where I started in this industry after punching cows. And I didn't punch cows, that was just the term we use. But in, in our opinion, you've got to have everybody talking about that economically viable, environmentally sustainable, and socially responsible food. You have to have everybody around the table. And, and let's face it, we've got to have enough to feed not only 311 million people, but we're exporting a lot of this, and it's critical to our society, to our communities, to our families, and to our GDP. So who's sitting around the table, guys? If you look at this table another way, and so for this slide we took and we, we harvested some data from first the Census Bureau in 2005. And, and the 2005 Census Bureau told us that the lowest income quintile, in other words, 20% of the U.S. population, the households, have income that is in this lowest quintile. That lowest quintile, the average of that was 13000 a little over 13000 bucks. Now, I started my career in the food supply chain in this lowest quintile, and I knew that I wanted to get out of that quintile. I could not raise a family. I could not put them through college. I could not do what I wanted to do. And I got out of it. I'm lucky. But I also respect the heck out of people that are in that quintile. And that's 28% of our society. How many times have you been in a stakeholder group or working and, and stuff like that and knowingly been dealing with people in that quintile? Got to have just as much respect for them as everybody else at the table. And you have to understand and empathize with the decisions that they have to make and that influence them. Now, 28% of their income, according to USDA EIB 23, from 2004, 2003 and 2004, that, that the USDA report told us that 28% of their disposable income goes towards food purchases. Good luck making that meet. That, that is tough. The highest income, conversely, the highest income, which represents 17% of the U.S. population, spends 7% of their disposable income. The average income that they're dealing with is $130,000. $130,000. That highest quintile goes over one hundred k. I I bet their table looks a little bit different than their table, eh? Be, be good if they could break bread with each other every now and then and talk about what's important to them, why it's important to them, what's socially responsible to them, what's environmentally sustainable to them, what's economically viable to them. That would, that would help us all, I think. 28% silent, typically, in these discussions. Typically silent in these discussions because they're busy trying to get stuff done and make ends meet. This group has a lot of time on their hand. Average over two, or two incomes in that house. Over two incomes in that house. Over two and a half cars in that house. Less than one car in this house. Very different issues. Very different perspectives. The rest fall in between. Critical as we think about stakeholder engagement. You think about this 311 million consumers, 310 million consumers. We use this framework to think strategically and to engage constructively around this. We, we borrow this from our friend Dr. Jason Clay at World Wildlife Fund, Harvard grad. Brilliant guy, genius. He says we're eating about one and a half planets worth of food and we've got to figure out how to be sustainable. 
And why? Because his mission is to save species. And he can't do it without biomes. And he can't have biomes without a healthy food supply that doesn't keep raiding the biomes and cutting them down and ripping it up. And so just like the economist and just like Frank talked about with that long shadow, those guys read page 283 and 284 of the long shadow. I mean, they knew that the conclusion in there was intensification. The executive summary never stated that. I don't know why. I have my skeptical and pessimistic beliefs of why the executive summary didn't, because they knew 99% of the population would read it. So you got 310 million consumers up here, and you got commodity producers down here. And you have the system in between it, processor, further processing, retailing, food service, distribution. So when you're dealing with 310 million up here, you're dealing with a couple million down here. You got thousands of legislators and regulators that look at this system and, and look at the whole thing and are responsible for keeping us safe, for keeping this food system wholesome, and for keeping it affordable. And we cannot throw them under the bus. They're critical stakeholder because they do it better than any other organization on, on a global basis. Best thing going. We have somewhere between 30 to 100 decision makers in here. And I know that sounds really low, but the, the hypothesis is that, is that you have bellwethers on critical brands that actually lead this system. And the average tenor for, for a product manager or marketing associate in one of these brands is somewhere around 24 months. Average age, somewhere around 26 to 28 years old. And they're making decisions with implications on a global basis. Now, of course, there are senior managers that are above them and everything. But the transition, the transient nature of what I'm, is, is one of the critical things that I'm talking about in here. Let's just pretend that you got a job as a marketing associate or a product manager for a dairy line in a national brand, even a regional brand. And the reason you got that job is you showed some skills and, and you, have, you, have, you have good skill set when it comes to marketing. And we need, you, we need you to help us elevate our brand and get more brand share. What are you going to do? Come in and say, well, I think the last person was doing a pretty good job. I think I'll keep the programs that they were doing and you know, see how we do. And How's that sound, boss? Next. Ain't going to happen, guys. You got to come in. You got to shake it up. You got to think about, hey, what can we have on our label they don't have on their label? What can, be, what, what can we be doing differently than they are doing? And how can we set ourselves apart? And what's important to consumers? Let's figure that out. There's another hypothesis that we use. Back many years ago, the guys at Ropers um, that are now owned by GFK. GFK is the fourth or fifth largest market research firm in the world. And so they're pretty smart people is I guess what I'm trying to say. And they came up with a system of identifying people that they term as influentials. About 10% of the population, it ends up in different categories and different populations. But about 10% of that population is responsible for taking action that leads to innovation and adoption and diffusion of innovations. So this goes back to Everett Rogers' model back from 1958-59, developed at Iowa State University on the adoption of corn hybrids. And that has evolved many, many times, obviously. But the core root of this says, so to questions that were posed earlier, what are consumers thinking? What are consumers thinking? Um, I don't have enough resources to care what consumers are thinking, to be honest with you. So I'm going to say, let's, let's isolate the population that's going to give us what consumers are going to be thinking about. And let's ask them some questions. Because they light a fire, the influentials light a fire, and, and they go and talk to their state legislators and regulators. They're parts of their local community leadership groups. They exercise their beliefs within their brands and within what they do and how they do it. They write letters to the editor. They take actions, okay? So let's, let's look at what they're doing. They're going to light the fire under the guys because this is the one that stacks the box and stacks the email and the emails for our legislators legislators and regulators. They also are the group that imposes um, their beliefs on these decision makers and says not only through their purchases, but they get engaged with their brands. That's where they take action. 
they aren't worried about here. They assume you're good people. They assume that we're all good people and we're doing right. And when, it's, when they see something otherwise, they're like, whoa, I didn't know that. You go to those 515 million commentary units that they picked up on the internet, which is already now for the first time, more people are getting their news on the internet than they are through papers. This month, first. Tipping point, guys. Now, let's take a look at it from another lens. From an antagonistic lens, let's just pretend that we're that, that small percentage of the population, for whatever reason, that doesn't like and want meat, milk, and eggs to be successful. I look at this framework and I say, yes, sweet. I can put pressure on choke points. I don't have to worry about this whole big group here, but I'm going to worry about and isolate my people that are loyal to me, and I'm going to give them national media, social networking, local activities, and local media, and I'm going to fuel the fire in them. They are going to pour that fire on the food chain because we're going to also have some shareholder resolutions. I'll buy a couple hundred shares, introduce a shareholder resolution, asking a brand to take an action, show up and be angry and vocal, but professional at the meeting because I don't want to look like a jerk who's out of touch. And I'll have my nice suit, and I'll have my hair cut, and I'll even have my eyebrows probably tweaked in that. Susie says I need to, and I refuse to. Sorry for that divergence. But I'm also going to put fuel on the fire with legislative efforts, state and federal, as well as the ballot initiatives. Look at the fire, look at the ring of fire that was created with the ballot initiatives, first in Florida with the South Stalls, next in Arizona with, with adding veal crates, then in, in California with adding cages, battery cages. Brilliant strategic move. Who's going to defend Florida? Let me tell you, nobody on South Stalls. Not, not, you couldn't justify it. What's there to defend? Maybe a hundred crates? Who cares? Take the fight where there isn't a fight. Get ground. They, they're brilliant, man. Just brilliant. Undercover investigations. We're going to put a guy in there, like, just like Rod said, man. Spot on, Neville. They're going to put a guy in there. They're going to put him in there for four weeks. He's going to capture several hundred minutes. It's going to be digested down to maybe 120 seconds. And we're going to have a beautiful time here running this ring of fire. Everybody hearing the Johnny Cash song going through their mind right now? Yeah. The flames get higher and higher. So, I look at it and I say, wrong. Our framework, our game, our lives. What are we going to do? We're going to build affiliates and allies within this group. We're going to have collaborative efforts. We're going to have integrated strategies. And we're going to minimize doing stupid things. And we're going to escalate the game. We're going to escalate the game by having science-based measurable outcomes that we're going to deliver on and we're going to hold ourselves accountable for. It's going to go beyond best practices. Because if all we're doing is best practices, then we're setting ourselves up for these outcomes that are, that are very difficult to maintain. Look at the UEP reaction to that and the beauty of that. They had a group come in and analyze it and associate, can we have certification with this or not? Good question. What were the real facts behind it? They had a framework. We're going to in integrate with, with legislative support and introduce ballot initiatives of our own that are going to demonstrate competency and increase confidence and, and trust in the system. We're going to have image campaigns that are going to focus on the influentials. Go where they go. Do what they do. Hunt where they hunt. Make them feel and understand the lens. Give them a lens to look through. One such activity where I was very fortunate to be involved with was the Global Conference on Sustainable Beef. Got involved with it with the, the uh, supply chain of Cargill, Intervet Shearing Plow, JBS, McDonald's, Walmart, World Wildlife Fund, several other organizations that contributed, but not to the, the level of partnership that these groups did. And from a metric standpoint, we held it back in November of 2010, and this is why I'm supposed to be talking to you today. We had 300 people attend. We limited it. We only did it by, by uh, registration and application. There were nine sectors. We had all the sectors of the supply chain represented. We had over 15 countries represented. 
several of you in the audience were there. We had conference goals that were pretty simple. We wanted to build relationships, share best science and practices, increase understanding of key issues, and explore multi-stakeholder solutions. Easy to do with an intimate crowd of 300, you know. You and your best friends getting together for three days in Denver. What did we do? Day one, we gave reports from across the globe and the sectors that demonstrated who we are, where we come from, what's important to us, how are we doing things, what are the key issues that we face. We found things that were in common, we found things that were very unique and different. Most importantly, the people who were involved in it spoke. It wasn't a spokesperson, it was the people telling their story, their real life, what reality means to them from an environmental standpoint, a social standpoint, and an economic standpoint. On day two, we had nothing but breakouts. We had concurrent sessions running in the morning, concurrent sessions running in the afternoon. We, we addressed seven topics in those breakouts that were very tightly managed with a key issues framework so that we weren't able to drift and go into ditches on the road, but that we were held accountable by talking about the environmental sustainability of it, the social responsibility of the issues, and the economic viability of the issues. Because just like those plates when they move, they have different repercussions that are far-reaching, long-lasting, and predictable. And we had people in those groups that could speak to them from their sense and their side of the table. That's critical and draining, to be honest with you. Mentally draining. Day three, we then took everything from the previous days and synthesized it down. I can tell you that there was a point in time in 2010 where I thought it would be a cold day in you know where that I would see Bill Donald, Forrest Roberts, Steve Fogelsong from NCBA standing hip to hip with Dave McLaughlin and Brian Weech at WWF. It happened. It worked. And not only that, they're talking to each other now. They've been up in Montana talking about what's important who it affects, how it affects them, what success looks like to each other. How did we do it? We set the bar high. We said we're going to get it done and we're going to do it right and we aren't going to go half <clears throat> on it. We set a terms of agreement. Everybody who attended that had to sign, physically sign, a term of agreement that said, first and foremost, we believe that the beef, a sustainable beef supply chain is important to meet the growing, the growing population's demand for nutrition. If you can't accept that, if your solution to beef sustainability is to eat less beef, you aren't welcome. Because we want people who are part of the solution, not part of the problem. That was difficult. That was very difficult for some. Because there is a vocal minority that is used to going in and throwing bombs and, and strapping bombs onto themselves and walking into these meetings and blowing it up socially. We've all seen it done. We aren't going to tolerate it anymore. It's unacceptable behavior. Multi-stakeholder diversity was critical, ge geographically, sector-wise. There are all things that, that we felt were critical to the success of this project and that the key issues framework. In other words, we took these issues and, and for example, an issue, greenhouse gas emissions, and we put that issue together, we put an issue brief together that frames it up from all different perspectives and offers it to the group in their breakout session and then says, let's answer some questions about what the issue means to you and your organization what the potential problems and solutions are that are associated with it and its effect on the triple bottom line. Environmental sustainability, social responsibility, economic viability. Let's talk about solutions and how we raise the bar.
Thanks.